Hello everyone and welcome to another News Coulomb video and another plug side chat. So just to kind of catch you up in case you missed the other video, I, I decided I wanted to do a series of these videos because I think the topic uh, deserves it. And essentially I was part of a, an EV focus group uh, focused on long distance travel in electric vehicles and you know, they were interviewing Model S owners, Model X owners, and Bolt EV owners about their experiences driving long distance uh, trips in electric vehicles. And one of the questions that they asked at the end, I thought was very, very interesting. And it, it was, what did we think the key factor for improving uh, electric vehicle um, adoption was? And they only really gave us a few options. It was uh, longer range, faster charging uh, or a more expansive or improved uh, DC fast charging network. So in a previous video, I talked about uh, why my choice of those and one of my top choices is increased range. But I wanted to address some of the other options that were presented because I think they're valid and truthfully for electric vehicles to be adopted at a, a a mass scale, more than one of them is going to need to happen. Now, uh, the the next one I want to address in this video is increasing the DC fast charger network. And a lot of people seemed to pick on that one specifically. And I think it's valid because yes, you, you do you do need um, more infrastructure development uh, right now in the United States. Other than, other than Tesla, right, there's no sort of expansive uh, DC fast charging network. And, and I, don't, I don't agree that we need to say, oh, there needs to be a single unified network. Uh, I, I think it's fine to have multiple providers, uh, Green Lots, ChargePoint, EVgo. Those are, it's fine to have multiple networks, but even when you count all of them combined, the, the public uh, DC fast charging network uh, is nowhere near as extensive as the uh, current supercharger model. But I, I feel like there needs to be some caution when we say, oh, it's just a matter of expanding the public charging infrastructure, uh, because I, I feel like part of it is we're um, working from uh, an existing model of what our electric vehicles are capable of. And that's kind of why I, I said that I felt range was more important because even though the, the Tesla supercharger network is as expansive as it is, uh, it doesn't address some of the fundamental issues that are associated uh, with electric vehicles. So even in a Tesla, even with that extensive supercharger network, your longer trips are still built around your charging stops. And that's a fundamental, like that's a shift that most Americans, I don't think would accept, right? Because they don't want their longer trips to be built around their fueling stops. Now, you know, Tesla does a very good job of sort of guiding you through the process. But the problem is uh, they're, they're, they're supporting an audience that's already willing to make those concessions. So pretty much any of the, the early adopter electric vehicle owners are willing to make some concessions. Uh, and so refueling points, while it's important and while it makes electric vehicles capable of fast long distance travel, it still doesn't address the fundamental hang up that most Americans would have with it, which is you're, you're planning your entire trip around your fueling stops. So if, if that's your primary focus, and again, like I said, none of these can be done in isolation. I, I feel if expanding the DC charging network is your primary focus, or you know, you're putting most of your eggs in that basket, uh, I, I don't think it's going to have the effect on the American public that you think it might in terms of EV adoption. Uh, and, and it really does come down to if you're on a 600, 
1,000, 1,200, 1,500 mile road trip with your family, a lot of people do what they call the splash and dash, the quick recharges, and they just move on. And, and so if, if part of your adding to the DC fast charging network is also increasing DC fast charging speeds, that's fine, but we're sort of talking about these things in isolation. Uh, I mean, I agree that that it does need to be expanded. There's there's no getting around it. Even with longer range vehicles, we're going to need that uh, because there's not even enough of these chargers in terms of uh, what I would consider destination chargers, right? Uh, chargers associated with businesses, chargers associated uh, with landmarks or places that you would typically stop on a road trip. So. Uh, there, there really is a multifaceted approach, but like I said, I, I would use caution because right now we're early adopters. Right now we're we're willing to to make concessions. My regular 500 mile trip I make to see my family, I, I've accepted the fact that you know once a month each way I'm spending an hour longer than I would take in a gas powered vehicle. I I just accepted that. Right. And that's a concession that I was willing to make in order to own an electric vehicle. Uh, and unfortunately, I think uh, whatever our keys to mass adoption for electric vehicles, uh, the general public can't really be asked to make concessions. The, and that's that's the trip up. Right. Is in order to get that early majority on the adoption uh, um, curve you're going to need to limit the concessions that they have to make. And the other thing is too, there's there's a real question in terms of expanding the DC fast charging network of who's going to pay for it, right? So Tesla has the model where the auto manufacturer is going to pay for it. Well, Tesla is charging a premium for their vehicles and that's what's paying for this network. Uh, you know, a thousand, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars a vehicle. Uh, that cost is, is being used to to fund it. VW. The only reason they're funding Electrify America is is because they're mandated to. It's a fine. It's punitive, right? But otherwise, they wouldn't. And I know people want to say, well, automakers should be funding it. Well, automakers are already making less money off of electric vehicles than they are off of gas powered vehicles. So now you're asking them to incur an additional expense. And you know, if you if you're saying that the the public needs to pay for it through an infrastructure bill, that's fine. Uh, but again, this this issue of fairness and entitlement comes up where you're asking for public dollars uh, it could actually push people away from electric vehicles, especially if they don't fundamentally agree with the need to transition to them. And in terms of businesses, especially when it comes to DC fast charging, the ROI is questionable, right? You, there are certain businesses that I think you could make a very compelling case that it, it's in their best interest to, to add DC fast charging. Uh, but again, you're still looking at a, a five to 10 year payoff probably for their investment. And, you know, that's not necessarily a compelling thing uh, for a lot of these businesses, especially uh, restaurant businesses, which are the type that I would think need to be focused on the most because you're already dealing with a business that has a, a very, you know, very small margins. And now you're asking them, to invest tens of thousands of dollars into into something that they might recoup their investment in five to ten years, that that's a big ask. So, well, yes, I do think uh, DC fast charging infrastructure is fundamental to the adoption of electric vehicles. I don't see the way. I don't agree with the way some people currently envision it. To me, I think the best way to address this issue is by focusing on what I would call travel chargers, travel centers, uh, essentially mimicking what Tesla is doing, you know, with some of their sites. So the Baker 
um, EV, uh, the Baker uh, supercharger, the uh, Kettleman City supercharger, where it's all there is at that location, right? You have 40 stalls dedicated to electric vehicle charging, and their sole purpose is to facilitate long distance travel. And if we can build centers like that, at the beginning, maybe every 150 miles of major freeway, um, and then fill in the gaps between. So you're looking at major travel center uh, type chargers every 75 to 100 miles of major interstate freeway. That's really all the DC fast charging network we need for now. Um, and that's what would facilitate travel with pretty much all electric vehicles without overburdening the infrastructure, without overburdening businesses, and let them naturally sort of fill in the gaps as we go. Uh, and again, that's why I am such a big proponent of the increased range, because it plays very well into that model where I feel like the focus for public charging infrastructure should be on those travel centers and low speed level two AC destination chargers at national parks, at campsites, at motels, at hotels, uh, at city centers that are surrounded by hotels and motels. Uh, those are the areas where I feel like the most, in, you know, the most impact could be had. And I think it would have the biggest impact on um, electric uh, vehicle adoption uh, by mainstream buyers. So I, I think it is an important aspect and I think it is a important key to increasing EV adoption, but I think it needs to be done smart and I think it needs to, to be very targeted. Anyway, um, I'm curious what you think about this topic, what you think about uh, the build out of the DC fast charging infrastructure, how it would impact uh, EV adoption. Uh, and I look forward to talking to about some of the more the other topics about uh, keys to improving uh, electric vehicle adoption, uh, making it more mainstream. Anyway, if you uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And uh, thank you for watching.